Greetings, everybody. Happy holidays, and welcome to TV Sky Rider. I'm Patricia A. Murray, your host. TV Sky Rider is where I talk to people about their lives. I talk to authors and musicians, interesting people, entrepreneurs. If you think you should be on TV Sky Rider, just write to me at DurhamSkyWriter at gmail.com. Now, today we have a very special guest. I've known this guy for Let's see, I moved from Chicago to Durham about 13 years ago. And Larry, I met you before I actually moved here. But let me introduce him for you. Okay. Larry Rennie Thomas. He uh, is a jazz DJ and a writer. And we're going to talk about his book, The Lady the Who Shot Lee Morgan. Right. Obviously, we're going to be talking about jazz tonight. All right, so... So, Larry, you don't even remember this, but I was going to move here to take care of my aunt. She had Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And I visited here to kind of set things up um, a year before, wait, yeah, a year before I actually moved. So, Centerfest was going on here in Durham, and I strolled right over to the WNCU table where you were, and I said, I'm going to have a show when I move here. And you mm -hmm. said, oh, you said, oh, okay, well, as soon as you move here, look us up. And I did. I remember. Yeah. I remember. I remember. I remember. I was the station manager at that time, I think, or the program director. And you Why came into the office and you wanted, wanted to do a show. I said, sure. Yeah, I thought it was a fantastic guy. Yeah, I'm, impressed with you. I'm impressed with what you did then, and I'm, I'm impressed with what you're doing now. Well, thank I think you, you're doing Larry. I like what you're doing as well. Thank you. Now, I want to start from the very beginning, because a lot of people who are into jazz, um, see, I don't know your history, so I'm learning along with the audience. I like to do it that way. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people who are into jazz, like they'll say that they discovered it in high school or they played it in college. I right. want to know when you first got interested in jazz. Mr. My Powell. father was a jazz aficionado. Um, he carried mail. He was a mailman. And whenever he would come home from work, the first thing he would do would put on some records. His favorite artist was Cal Basie. He would play uh, Sarah Vaughan, Billy Eckstein, uh, Duke Ellington, all these people. And we were children, and we hated it because, you know, that was what? the Motown era, during the Motown era. We didn't want to hear it. We considered that old folks' music. Okay. So I was indoctrinated. I was, uh, I was exposed to the vibrations and the radiation at a very, uh, as soon as I got out of the cradle, I guess. So okay. I grew up listening to this music. I don't so call it jazz. I call it American classical music. Okay. Jazz is short for jackass. <laughs> okay. Now, when did you start liking it, though? It wasn't until I got in grad school that it really kicked in. Okay. You know? I, because what I what I like to do is I, I like, I guess I'm a multitask person. I could watch TV, turn the volume down, and listen to music and read. So while I'm reading and studying, I would always play music. Okay. And I, just, something just happened one one day. I was kept listening to music and. No, I tell you what actually happened. This is a strange story. I was okay. living in I was living in Durham and I would have to when I was in grad school I would have to commute to get to Chapel Hill. And at that time I didn't have a car. So what I was doing every day I would thumb. I would have to thumb to Chapel Hill. No way. I didn't have any problems, you know, it was always cool. And oh. one day a guy picked me up and he was driving this raggedy, I forgot what kind of car it was, but he was listening to this tape. And it was Dexter Gordon. Ooh. I, I, I said, well, what is this white cat listening to? You know, it didn't make any difference at that time. But it, I just thought, this guy was from Connecticut. And he was exposed to the music. So mm. he said, this is Dexter Gordon. I said, really? I said, well, what's the name of this piece? He said, it's uh, Broadway from the album Our Man in Paris. Okay. So what happened was, once we got to Chapel Hill, to the university on campus, he said, well, come on in to my fraternity house. We went to his, fraternity, went to his house. Fraternity house. The first thing I saw when I walked in the fraternity house was a Confederate flag. <laughs> so I said, oh. "Oh, okay." So awkward. Right. So we went upstairs, and he just playing, kept playing all this Dexter Gordon. I said, "Well, can I borrow it? this album?" He said, "Yeah, sure." So I started listening to more Dexter Gordon, and for some reason, one day it just something just clicked, you know. Hmm. And, I, and I bought everything that Dexter had, and I've been hopelessly hooked on. You know, on Dexter for sure. And I got to meet him later on. I got to interview him later. I actually got to, to go by his pad and talk to him and everything. You know, we got to be real good friends. But it was Dexter Gordon that opened me up. 
Okay. I've been well, hoping ever since. Well, I grew up in a jazz household. Uh, my dad liked jazz as well. And, but we took to it right away because, we, I mean, how can you resist jazz? I mean, I can't imagine not loving jazz. But here's what we used to do. When our parents were uh, young, they used to party a little bit in a very modest way. And we would um, peek at them from, from the, the stairwell. Sure. We thought everything they were doing was what we wanted to do when we got when we got older, you know, they were smoking and drinking and listening to jazz and right. playing cards and stuff. And we were like, oh, that is. Now, of course, the smoking and drinking, uh, of course, I, I, I realized uh, later that wasn't cool. But the jazz I stuck with. Okay. And um, I've always, I always tried to play it. I, I play guitar, not very well, but but I always tried to at least, you know, do something with jazz. I tried to write music. And it'll always be. It has always been and will always be a very major part of my life. The most sophisticated music in the world produced by the most sophisticated people in the world, African Americans. There you I go. See that all the time. But what happened to me, Pat, was I got hopelessly hooked on it and I actually turned this into a profession. I've I've been in radio since nineteen seventy eight. I've Ooh. been on the air since nineteen seventy. I worked at about seven or eight different radio stations. The only thing I've ever done is program American what? American. How'd you get started? How'd you get started? I started when I was in grad school. I, start, I, I started over here in Chapel Hill at mm -hmm. WXYC, which is the student station. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what actually what actually happened was I came down with an ulcer, and oh. my doctor recommended that I find something to do as a stress buster. I started jogging, and so mm -hmm. I've always wanted to be in radio. So I went over to WXYC, which is a student operating station on UNC's campus, and uh, I auditioned. Mm -hmm. By the way, the management the guy, the man, he said, man, you got a radio voice, man. She said, you should be on radio. So I said, okay. I didn't know what that meant. So I started doing this program on Sundays from 12 until 4. And I did jazz. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how I really got started. Uh, and what happened, another thing that happened as a result of that, I met some Trinidadian friends I have mm -hmm. here in Chapel Hill who were part of a reggae band called Raleigh Gray and Sunfire, and they convinced me to do two hours of jazz and do two hours of reggae. Mm, so I went from 12 to 2, I did jazz, and then I divided the program, I did from 2 to 4, I did reggae, and the reggae was a hit. Nice. Now, do you, mind my, ask, do you mind my asking if you were able to choose your own music? I know at some stage oh, yeah. oh, you yeah. allow you to do that. Yeah. Well, what happened was that next year, around 78 or 79, there was a station that came into being called WDBS, which was actually owned by Duke University. It was on Broad Street. Okay. And it was 107.3 or something like that. Mm -hmm. They want they their format was interesting. They programmed European classical music in the, in the daytime, and they programmed American classical music, jazz music at night. So mm -hmm. I, I I went over there and I got Donald Baker was actually the person who recommended that I go over there and talk to him. So that was my first paying job. Okay. My first paying gig was from 2.30 a.m. until 6 a.m. <laughs> 2.30 a.m. until 6 a.m. Five nights a week. Oh, that's kind of cool. It was very rigorous. It was pretty, real tough. You know, but I, but I got to meet all the jazz musicians because Brother Youssef would call me, you know, because they would do gigs and they would call and they would, they would say, hey, they, call, they started calling me Dr. Jazz because I, I would put a scholarly spin on the music. Okay. I stayed with that station for about two years, and I got to meet all, when the jazz musicians would come to town, of course, we interviewed them. And that's where I first met Dexter Gordon. He came mm -hmm. by the station, and we interviewed him on, on, on our program, on our sta at our station. So mm -hmm. I really got into it real heavy. Then after that, I moved to back home to Wilmington. And I worked mm -hmm. at a public radio station down there called WHQR. I worked for them for almost 10 years. Wow. Five no. Five was, it, was it a jazz station or what? No, it was, they did European classical music in the daytime. My shift started at 10. I was mm -hmm. on from 10 until 1. And so what I start, decided to do on that Saturday night, Sunday morning, was go from 1 a.m. to 4 a.m. and call the program Caribbean Sounds. And I did uh, reggae. And I split up in the middle uh, a half an hour, did a half an hour of soca music from Trinidad. And mm -hmm. that was a really big hit. Mm -hmm. I had little kids coming by the radio station. This receptionist told me this funny story. 
she said the, uh, one kid came by the radio station and she said, oh, oh, they said, oh, this is WHQR. This is the reggae station. She said, no, not really. <laughs> it was for her. Ah, she got mad. She really got mad. The reception said, no, this is a classical station. But that just goes to show you. And, you know, I've always said in radio, you never know who's listening. It may be the president of the United States that's listening. You know, it's like that's why you have to be very creative, and you just have to, you just have to welcome, be a welcoming, uh, I guess, a welcoming mat for people. You have to be very pleasant, and you can't be too chummy. You know, mm -hmm. just play the music and explain who's on the music. Explain, you know, people really want to know who's on the record. They want to know who, when it was recorded, and that kind of thing. They really mm -hmm. want to know that, and they want to know what the time is. And what the temperature is on the outside, and what the weather is, and I learned those things. Mm -hmm. HQR after HQR, I I actually was the manager of a radio station, an AM radio station in Wilmington, WWIL, for about hmm, about a year. That didn't last too long because the station was real powerful. We did um, jazz, mm -hmm. uh, reggae. We also did Farrakhan, and we did WD Muhammad. The oh. people loved it, but it was yeah. a commercial station. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine who was a funeral director and a senator, he, I don't know how he got this, he may have wanted gambling, but he, he had an AM station and he convinced me to leave WHQR and come and manage his, state, his station. It was great for a while. And then after that, I went back to HQR, and then after that, I came back to Durham because Donald Baker told me he was going to open up WNCU. And I stayed with WNCU for eight years. Wow. Now, how did you do all this? Well, did you have a degree of some kind of communications? Is that why have, you were I have, I have an MA in history. I have an MA in history. And I, 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 was, I was in grad school doing most of this. And I also went one year for to try to get an MA in journalism, but it didn't work, work out. I only went one year. But I, so, I, I have an MA in history, and I, I have one year in, as a master's degree student in journalism. Mm -hmm. At UNC. So your radio experience, you learned on the job then? Yeah, basically. I was th Yeah, that's a good way to say it. Yeah, sure. Tell mm -hmm. us about the shirt you're rocking tonight. It looks like a very familiar station to me. Uh, it's my favorite station. I listen to it all the time. WBGO is um, probably the, the one of the best, one of the best uh, jazz stations I've ever heard because they do what I try to do, explain the music and, you know, explain where the music is coming from. It's a dynamite station. It's out of Newark, New Jersey. It serves the metropolitan area in New York. And when I go to New York, I, what I, I always listen to it, you know. I'm, I am um, hopelessly hooked on jazz. Oh, yeah. Have, Brother Youssef told me one time, you got to have it. <laughs> and that's Brother Youssef Salim, the late yeah. great. Yeah, had to mention his last right. Yeah, but it's been a, it's been a wonderful journey, Pat, because I've got to meet all these musicians. I've even done uh, uh, audio documentaries on all of these musicians. I've, I've interviewed. I've become good friends with Jimmy Heap, who was actually uh, went to high school in my, in my hometown of Wilmington. I know all these jazz musicians. They consider me one of the cats. You know, it's just wonderful. Now, tell us what radio show you do now. I'm I'm on from nine to twelve. As a matter of fact, when we finish with this, I'll, I'll go over there. Um, WCOM, it's a community radio station, and you have all kind of, um, uh, it's a mixed, mixed format. But my program is called Sunday Night Jazz. And um, I, I'm basically doing the same thing I did, because I was the host of Evening Jazz for WNCU for mm -hmm. eight years. And I bas I bas it's basically the same program. I do pre-1945 stuff like Duke Ellington, Count Basie, you um, know, Louis Armstrong, and then and then I do bebop, so-called bebop, modern jazz. I do Latin jazz. I do ballads. It, it's it, you know it's it's been a it's been nice. It's been so people want to hear you. So people who will take a liking to you after this interview will want to hear you. So they can go online, can't they, to listen to WCOM yes. at nine o'clock? When we say nine o'clock, that's Eastern time here yeah. in the U.S. www.wcomfm.org and uh, www.wcomfm.org. So, I mean, this is, Pat, this is all I've ever done. You know, this is all I've, all I've ever done is jazz. 
That's amazing to me. That's I, I know it is. My my mother and father went because they basically supported me in grad school. And my dad, once I graduated, my dad said, "Well, damn, we sent you to grad school. <laughs> you a radio DJ." <laughs> and once they started listening to me, they realized that I did a little bit more than that. And then I I became a promoter. I started promoting concerts and mm -hmm. dance concerts, reggae concerts. I'm also a writer. I contribute to about four different. Uh, websites um, allaboutjazz.com, jazzcorner.com, um, eJazz, Jazz Times. Um, I'm a uh, downbeat uh, critic for the past two or three years. I've been a downbeat critic. I'm also, I've also been designated a jazz hero. That was in 2014, this year, by the Jazz Journalists Association. How about that? So I'm a, I'm a jazz man. <laughs> Now, back in Chicago, I, I grew up there and used to listen to WBEE, but also WBEZ. And I remember Dick Buckley, one of the uh, the DJs on WBEZ. I don't think he played much music past World War II, or I mean, he really liked older music. Okay. So, so do you keep up with the new cats, or do you pretty much stay in a particular right. zone? Oh no, no, I mix it up. You know, I I, I started from this evolution. 1900s, and I bring it all up until today, you know, and it's, it all swings. It's all a part of the American, African American experience. Mm -hmm. Basically, what I agree with you. It's just that some people say, you know, these kids today, you know, they don't, you know, how some people are, they're old fogies and they don't yeah. want to give yeah. yeah. So, before we talk about your book, this one here, mm -hmm. Lady Shot Lee Morgan, if you don't mind, because you did mention Wilmington. Right. Mind very quickly telling us about um, the other two books that you've written, just real quick. Well, I, I, my my first published book was actually my thesis, and it it, it actually has a long name. It's called uh, the, A Study of Racial Violence Prior to February First, Nineteen Seventy One. Uh, so I changed the name as a commercial venture. And I call it the True Story Behind the Wilmington Ten. Okay. The Wilmington 10 were considered political prisoners by Amnesty International during the 70s. It, it was a big deal. It was like Michael Brown and, and Trayvon Martin today because it was a big black issue. Mm -hmm. They were accused of burning down a white-owned grocery store during a week of racial violence in my hometown of Wilmington. Now, I wasn't there, but I, I was in school in Nashville, Tennessee at the time, but I arrived a, a day after it was all over with. Hmm. They received excessive sentences. I wrote about it. I interviewed hmm. people. I interviewed over 100 people who were there in Wilmington when it happened. Mm -hmm. and I was able to get this book out on the market. Um, Wilmington is one of the most um, racist places that I've ever been. Uh, hmm. And it's basically because of what happened in 1890. It was a massacre. It was not a race riot. And people can Google Wilmington race riot of 1890 to find out more information about that. But my thesis went all the way back to the beginning of the town and brought it all the way up until February 1st, 1971, which was the day that Ben Chavis, who was the leader of the Wilmington 10 mm -hmm. came. The mm -hmm. second one I did was called Rabbit, Rabbit, Rabbit. See, what happened was these students decided to boycott the schools. Okay. When they decided to boycott the schools, they were meeting at a church. The headquarters was at a church in Wilmington. Mm -hmm. And as they were meeting at this church, Ku Klux Klan and vigilantes came around shooting at the church. Mm -hmm. Now the students were going in and out of the church, and one of the code words, the password that they used was rabbit, rabbit, rabbit. And I got this from everybody that I interviewed. Okay. So that was the name of my second book, Rabbit, 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 a fictional account of the Wilmington 10 incident of February 1971. So those are my two books, and it basically dealt with racial violence. So I decided, <laughs> and I'm not going to deal with this anymore, yeah. you know, because it, 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 it was basically a happy ending, because okay. what happened was they were pardoned, eventually pardoned, mm -hmm. and eventually received financial compensation. And unfortunately, a couple of them um, are already deceased. Um, Joe yeah. Wright went to Talladega with me. I remember oh, okay. Him. You knew Joe, yeah. yeah. Brent and I think one of the ladies died. Yes. Um, uh, actually, what's the um, one, two, three, four of them have died. Yeah, four, four of them are, are, are now deceased. 
But like I said, it's a happy ending because they got finan they got pardoned and they got mm -hmm. financially compensated. And like I said, I'm not dealing with that anymore. <laughs> I've moved on to sure. Sure. Yeah, from my first to my first love really, which is American classical music. Okay. Comedy so yes. So let's segue into this. Mm -hmm. And and the title, The Lady Who Shot Lee Morgan, it's right. it's a simple statement, but I'm just even though it sounds simple, sometimes uh -huh. Simplest things take a lot of thought, so I'm wondering why you named it the lady who shot Lee Morgan. Because it, you could have named it the woman who killed Lee Morgan. I mean, you could have, you could have called it any, any kind of, you know, any number of titles. So why did you choose that very simple sounding title? I don't know. I, 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 I that's a good question. I mean, I've all, you know, I found out by by writing and being in grad school, but well, not grad school, but but writing, because I've done a lot of writing. I found out that most people are simple-minded. I don't mean that in a derogatory manner, but you don't try to use too many, as they say, 50-cent words. And I think that goes that goes straight to, cuts it, straight to the chase. Yeah, keep the it simple. Shot me more. Some people don't consider her a lady. Some people have said, why did you call her a lady? Yeah, that's what I was wondering, yeah. yeah. I don't know. She, she appeared to be a lady to me. I was mm -hmm. teaching at Shaw University Cape down in Wilmington, and Shaw has these centers all over the state. Mm -hmm. They even have one in Durham. It's called the Center for Alternative Programming and Education. And basically my students consisted of uh, women from the ages of 30 to, I'd say, 60. And mm -hmm. I met Hel Helen Morgan because she was one of my students. Okay. So, and as a way of introducing myself to the class, I would hand out this sheet, biographical information. I said, well, I want everybody to write a bio. And this mm -hmm. is what I want it to look like. And so it mentioned the fact that I was a host a local evening jazz host at the local public radio station. Mm -hmm. So right away, she says, oh, I like jazz. I love jazz. My my husband was a jazz musician. Mm -hmm. And I said, really? What was your husband's name? And her last name, she always called herself Morgan. She said, Lee. I said, Lee <laughs> Morgan? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, yeah, he was my husband. And right away, I kind of figured who she was. <laughs> because anybody who knows anything about jazz knows that story. It's, it's almost like well, folklore, a Frankie, mm -hmm. John, Frankie and Johnny kind of thing. His common law wife killed him while he was gigging down at a club called Slugs. And okay. I said, well, I sure would like to interview you one day. And she said, well, I'll think about it. And that was in 1990. She finally consented. To, every time I would see her, I said, Mrs. Morgan, I want that interview. So she said, okay, I'll let you know. So she finally consented in 1996, February of that year, to do an interview. And I went over to her, her pad, her house, mm -hmm. put my tape recorder down, and I just let her talk. And okay, a, month no, later, a month later, she died. She died but, in March of 96. Okay, let, let me just jump in, if you don't mind. Um, had she discussed no. this incident with anyone else before? I don't. I didn't get that impression, no. Wow, so this is what we like to call a scoop. Yeah, it's exclusive. Nobody has this information. I mean, she was very active in the church. Um, a lot of people, well, who the hell knows who Lee Morgan is? And oh, no yeah. one possibly yeah. knew that she killed Lee Morgan. But she yeah. was a church-going lady. She cooked a lot for the church. They knew her as Miss Morgan, the church lady. And, you know, she just came back to, she'd been living in New York, she came mm -hmm. back to Wilmington, I guess, to chill out and to take care of her mother. Her mother was ill at that time, but she became this church lady. Okay, here's the thing. She killed her husband, or her common-law husband. How did she trust you enough to even talk about it? I don't know. That's the, that's the $64,000 question, I guess. I don't know. I, did, I guess I came across as, well, yeah, you know, because I've been in the world, quote unquote, I've been in the world. I lived in New York. I was in New York uh, during the late '60s and this early '70s. Mm -hmm. So I knew that whole scene, yeah. the drug scene that he was involved in. I knew that I was. I guess she could sense that in me. Mm -hmm. She was. Um, she. You could tell she's been. She'd been around the block a few times. She was yeah. no slow leak. <laughs> she was not a slow leak at all. And she was able to talk about the incident. Did she talk about her life or just that one? Oh, yeah. 
Oh yeah, she talked about when she met him. She talked about their life together. How she. It was really nice because here's a lady who didn't really had barely a high school education, who was booking his gigs. Whenever someone would call their apartment, she would he would hand the phone to her. She would book all the gigs. She would take care of the airplane flights. She would take care of their accommodations. She would make sure that they practice practice and everything. She, she told me all of that. And I kept, because, you know, I've interviewed people before. I've done old history projects before. But I didn't want um, to, get a, to let that interview get away without her talking about actually killing him. Mm -hmm. Because that would be the clincher. So mm -hmm. I, didn't say, I didn't say very much at all. And I kept saying, I kept saying to myself, well, when is she going to mention it? So finally, near the end, she mentioned when she shot him. Mm -hmm. You know, I got all of that on tape. And I was just about to find out what happened after she had got arrested and everything, and her grandson walked in, and she cut it. She just stopped right yeah, there. Yeah, I understand. You understand. know, and so, so I said, I said, I want to interview you again. I want, you know, I want to continue this conversation. Yeah, yeah. So she said, sure, uh, I'll call you or call me. And then I went back to Chapel Hill because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. she lived in Wilmington. And then a few months later. I was talking to Etta James. Etta Jones mm -hmm. who was a good friend of hers. She was performing okay. over at the Arts Center. And, and she said, well, you know, Helen has passed because she was a friend of Helen. And that's how I found out that Mrs. Mrs. Wow. Moore did. Wow. I didn't know. It was a shocker to me. Wow, I bet. Yeah. So how did they meet? Because she was older than, than Lee Morgan. How did, how did they meet? Yeah. She was 12 or 13 years older than he was. She lived, she, interesting enough, she did not live uptown. She did not live in Harlem. She lived down um, near 52nd Street. And she moved to New York in 1945. Okay. It's an interesting story about how she got to New York. Mm -hmm. She had her first child at the age of 13. Mm. She lived on a farm across the river from Wilmington in Brunswick County in a place called Shalote. She had her first child at 13. Mm -hmm. Then she had another child at 14. Boy. She left and moved to Wilmington. Started living, married a bootlegger. At age 17, she married a guy who was 39. Boy. Drowned. Okay. Okay. Family came down to take care of the funeral and everything and took her back to New York. She's 19 years old in 1945 in New York in the middle of the modern jazz era, in the middle of the bebop era. She got mm -hmm. to know all these cats. She had an apartment which was near 52nd Street. Okay, Midtown. These kind of people who like to serve food to people and like to, you know, she really had a heart for downtrodden people, winos and junkies, and derelicts and stuff. She would bring them into her apartment and help them. But once the cats finished performing, they would come over to her crib. Mm -hmm. Two or three o'clock in the morning. Wow. One morning, she was dating um, Benny Powell. The okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dated a lot of jazz musicians. One one morning, he brought Lee Morgan by her house. It was snowy on a February day, February night, February mm -hmm. morning, and Lee Morgan didn't have anything on but a jacket. A little the baby is cold outside. With, yeah, windbreaker jacket, she, and that's what she said. She said, "Child, you know, with a southern thing, say, child, where's your overcoat? You gotta have an overcoat." And she said, Lee Morgan said. It's in the pawn shop. She said, well, where's your axe? Where's your trumpet? He said, that's in the pawn shop, too. She said, well, mm. we're going to go and get your stuff out of the pawn shop. Mm. So she said, he said, oh, you're going to get my stuff out of the pawn shop? She said, her, her heart just went out to this little boy. Mm -hmm. That's what she called him. So that's mm -hmm. how she met me more. And she said, at that point, he moved in with her. Okay. She, said, she took over, quote, unquote, she totally took over Morgan's life. She was she more like his mom? That's what happened later on, because uh, of course the relationship got to a point where she was getting, gaining an age, and she was on. He was still shooting drugs. Oh, he wasn't good. shooting heroin per se, because at that time in New York, and I was there, there was no heroin on the street. At, at one point, there was a lot of cocaine, and he was shooting cocaine. And of course, mm -hmm. that makes you real nervous and jittery. And she was complaining to him about doing so much cocaine. Okay. She was, and he, she said this herself. 
she thought that maybe at that point Lee was looking at her as his mother instead of his lover. Because she was asking him all the time and taking care of him. Yeah, harassing him about getting high all the time. Mm-hmm. And so at that point, he actually wasn't staying with her. He would, he would stay away for months. I'm not months, but weeks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Come back to, to the apartment. And that way, the relationship got real strained. It was a very strained relation, relationship. And that the night that she killed him, she hadn't been. They hadn't been together in a long, long time. They hadn't been seen out in the public for a long, but didn't, long time. Didn't he get like another girlfriend? He had another girlfriend. Yeah. As a matter of fact, he was with her when she walked into Slugs that morning, and yeah. she walked over to the table, and he got up and they got into a conversation, and the girl said. Why are you talking to her? I thought you two were, weren't together anymore. So mm-hmm. she said that he, he said that he said, this is what Helen Morgan said, mm-hmm. I'm not with this, excuse me, I'm not with this bitch. I'm just telling her to leave me alone. Mm-hmm. And she said at that point, she slapped him. Mm-hmm. He had her put out of the club. He mm-hmm. took a bag and coat and threw it out, out, outside in the snow. And she said when the bag fell to the ground, the gun fell out. Oh, she had a gun with her. Well, yeah, a gun that actually he bought the gun for her, for protection, because he was leaving her there at the house all by herself. Mm. He bought the gun for her. And he picked the gun up and went back into the club. And he he was coming at her because they had had an argument, a heated argument. And he mm. was coming at her in such a heated rage uh, that she pulled the trigger and killed her. In front of everyone. Yeah, and, do, and doing intermission. And every, people were just sitting there. I mean, everybody saw it. I mean, it's crazy. She said the club cleared. <laughs> she said, well, that's not funny. She said the club cleared at that point. And she said she couldn't believe what she had done. Did she know? just stand there and wait for the police or what? Done. She said she just sat there. She didn't know what to do. And then the police showed up and uh, took her off to, to jail. And Dean Morgan was dead on the spot, huh? Well, some people say different things. Some people said he just bled because the ambulance, and they said the snow was so high that it was very difficult for the ambulance to come and get him. Wow. Said he basically bled to death. Wow. Man, that must be hard. It was very tragic. Lonely way to die. Yeah. Ooh. Wow. So how did, okay, so you got the interview all on tape. You said that you just let her talk. You didn't mm-hmm. even guide her. She just talked. Right. So did you get a sense that she was unburdening her soul pretty much? Getting it I mean, she never talked to anybody about it. I suppose she was holding it in. Yes. That's exactly what I the impression that I got, you know. She seemed a little bit taken back when I first put the tape took the tape recorder out. And I said, mm-hmm. Is it okay if I use the tape? She said, Yeah, sure, I figured you would be gonna do that. But I got the impression that this was something that she had on her chest and that she wanted to get off and that she hadn't talked to anybody about it. And it was a strange feeling to, to talk to her because she was a student of mine and I'm looking at this lady and I said, well, this is not the same person who was yeah. in my class. And I said, okay, cool. So I just let her talk and it was, it was like a kiss met. It was something she wanted to do. I think she, she had been in and out of the hospital. As a matter of mm-hmm. fact, she had on clothes but she had a bathrobe over the clothes, and she was kind of coughing and throughout mm-hmm. the whole interview. And I figured uh, later on, I kind of surmised that you know this was her last testimony. But I'm sure she hasn't talked to. Well, I'm not positive, but I don't think she's talked to anybody. She had talked to anybody about. It. Well, she had. They would have written a book about it, right? So. Exactly, or mm-hmm. or written something about it. But I wrote a piece as a result of the interview and posted it on the internet in 2007. Um, I called it the lady who shot Lee Morgan. Oh, it, so oh, so you didn't write the article first? No, it went from here to Thailand. It's been translated into several different languages. When you said you uh, wrote a piece, do you mean the book or, or an article? The article is going from here to everywhere. Oh, so it was an article. Okay. okay. Yeah, it was, a, it was an article called the lady who shot Lee Morgan. And it's been read by everybody, I guess. I, I get Google Docs every day to share, uh-huh. almost every day. I got one today. 
do you, do you get any correspondence from people saying, "Wow, that's sure. you know, sure. how did you do it, or is this a crazy story, or just oh, any?" Yeah, I get it all the time. Most of the people appreciate it. Mm -hmm. There are some who didn't appreciate the fact. You know, they call them all kind of names, and most of the musicians don't dig it at all. They say, "Who cares what a murderer has to say?" I understand the, their point of view. I mean, she killed one of the greatest trumpet players of all time. Right. So I can understand the musicians not wanting to hear what she had to say at all. Still, it happened, and um, I'm sure in the back of their minds, they're wondering why in the world did she do that. I'm sure they might not admit it to you, but I'm sure they were all wondering why someone would do that. So she explained it to you. Well, yeah, yeah she's brokenhearted. That's mm -hmm. basically that was basically the way I would sum it up. And she, you know, she she actually said, "Well, I did all this for him, and I did this for him. He wasn't supposed to do that." That's what she mm -hmm. actually said. Mm -hmm. so, it was her story, you know. And so I decided to to write a book on. It. Okay. You know, my, my, and I also wrote a poem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Called Cold night, cold night in New York City. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. About it, the point is actually in there. I have it's a, you know it's a pretty good little book. It's got mm -hmm. photos and everything. Photos. It has a discography and you know the book's doing pretty good. I've done two book signings uh, recently. In September, I went to Washington Sankofa Bookstore and I went to a, a book a bookstore in New York called Sisters Uptown mm -hmm. in Manhattan. I did two days there and I've done about four or five radio interviews. Okay. So also now, people last times on it. Okay. Now, now, how much time had elapsed between the article and the book, and why did you decide to just really flesh it out and make it an entire book? Well, I was contacted by a, a Swedish filmmaker who wanted to do a film on Lee Morgan, um, and he wanted to obtain the rights to my interview. He wanted to use Helen's voice in the movie. Okay. I told him, yeah, okay. So we found this. There was another guy in San Francisco who actually wanted to do a film on it. He, mm -hmm. he called me too. But mm -hmm. he wanted to do a, like a Hollywood spin on it. The guy over in Sweden wanted to do a documentary. So I went with him. Okay. And, um, so after we had done everything that he wanted to do, he went to her hometown and he actually went to her church and talked to her church members and everything, and mm -hmm. he talked to me and everything. I just decided that it would be a good idea to write a book about my experience with mm -hmm. Helen Morgan. So I did it uh, December 2013. Okay. And we published it in, uh, f uh, just in time for Black History Month, February 2014. So it's been out not quite a year yet. So did, did you discover um, when you start writing the book, and that means fleshing out the story, did you find yourself remembering things that you had forgotten before? Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes that happens. Yeah, I did, yeah. Um, one of the things, you know, I guess one of the things that struck me about her, and I mentioned it earlier, was she was, she'd been around the block, man. She was... <laughs> She was nobody's slow leak, and then when she started talking about mm -hmm. her experiences in mm -hmm. New York, you know, some of the stuff that I could relate to, because I was in the city too, mm -hmm. and I said, well, this lady is, uh, you know, because she she was talking, she talked about how they went to all these jazz concerts, and how she met Miles Davis, and how she met, uh, she they had an apartment up on the Grand Concourse in the Bronx. The Bronx. That, that was really, you know, a swanky mm -hmm. place to be on the mm -hmm. Grand Concourse because Lee had started making a little money and okay. she said one time they were, she, they had parties all the time, mm -hmm. they had pillows all around and she said there was a white guy in there. She said, what is this white cat doing you know, around all these jazz musicians? And it was Jerry Mulligan. Oh, wow. You know, wow. And she said, she said she, she, you know how we do, she said she was just talking, she said, nigga, what, you know, and this and that. She yeah. turned around and they said, the white boys over there. She said, well, I said it now. So she said, she went over there. She said, well, who are you? And she said, she said, he said, Jerry Mulligan. And okay. so she said, so? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 
So that means he was welcome, right? He came over and said, this is Helen, this is my wife, this is, you know, Jerry Mulligan. And so, but it was fascinating. She knew, I said, well, um, you know, throw, throw out some names. She said mm -hmm. she, she met them all, D Donna Washington, she mm -hmm. met Sarah Vaughn, she met Carmen McCray, Billie Holiday. She told me the story about Miles, how she was backstage, and Miles came backstage, and she was sitting backstage, and so said Miles, she's, I said, but what about Miles? And mm -hmm. the first thing she said, nasty. Mm -hmm. she, she, he said she treated his, he said that Miles treated his women like dirt. She said he would call them all kind of bitches and everything. And said mm -hmm. she came, came over to her and said, um, and who are you supposed to be? Supposed to be. Who are you supposed to be? And she said, and she said, she looked at him, she said, well, I am, I ain't supposed to be, I am Lee Morgan's woman. Uh-uh. And, okay. and she said that Miles said, well, I see you got a fast mouth. And she said, he said, a quick mouth. He said, I don't like bitches with quick mouths. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, we don't have nothing to talk about no way. She said, because I don't play the trumpet. She said, with that, he walked away. <laughs> so she was just telling me all these stories. She's just, yeah, I heard he was kind of ill-tempered and rude sometimes. So. Well, this is the story that she related to me. I've talked to other musicians who said they had a good relationship with Miles. And, you know, I think Miles is just, you know, a kind of cat who didn't like a lot of nonsense. You know, I, I've talked to, I've interviewed a lot of you. I've interviewed, I've even interviewed Art Blakey. Ooh, you know? okay. Art Blakey was one of the most insightful persons I've ever interviewed. And, and I mean, he, anything would come out of his mouth. And if I'm Miles, curious about him. Miles was rough, then Art Blakey must have been super rough. I want to ask you about Art Blakey because I grew up loving his music and knowing, I was aware of the fact that he, they would refer to him like, um, like he was kind of like a schoolmeister and that so many young people came through his band yes. on their way to greater fame in the jazz world. But it wasn't until recently that I realized, or I had read, that he had turned a lot of these young cats onto drugs, which yeah. really I find extremely upsetting. That is not okay. what Steve Weister does. So well, he I'm turned curious about that side of him. They said he was like a teacher, but how could someone actually want people to, to take drugs and, you know, well, uh, uh, he, he actually was the person who turned Lee on. Uh, he told, Ellen told me the story about when she hated Buena, uh, that was Art's name. Mm. He was actually a Muslim. She hated Art Blakey. She, mm. um, she said that when Lee, when Art Blakey turned Lee on to heroin, mm. Lee asked him, said, uh, how long does it high last? And she said, Art said, forever. Oh, no. But, some people say that the reason why Art, Art turned a lot of his musicians on, and this is hearsay, I don't know, was because he didn't pay him a lot. And if you were strung out and you had this tab, you know, if you had this tab, you were copping heroin and, you know, say, well, you need the shot, man. I'll, you know, I got some heroin and then, you know, it'll go on your tab. So when it got time for the cast to get paid, <laughs> they didn't get nothing. Because they got all they, all they pay up and with the hair on, you know. I mean, that's the life, man. If, if you want to be a part of that, it's got to be a part of it. It's not, it's, not, it's not a big deal to me. I understand it perfectly. It wasn't a big deal to me at all. It sounds so dirty to me. I don't know. I mean, I'm not trying to be judgmental. It's it, very is, wrong. it is disappointing. Let's put it that way. It's very disappointing to think that somebody would do that. Well, he didn't hook all of them. All of them. But they were grown men. It's not like he... Uh, pulled their arms behind their backs and insisted that they t take notes, So Some people can control it. I mean, Art got high. My understanding is Art, Art got high um, almost up until, you know, his passing. Because he could control it. But a lot of cats can't control A lot of cats aren't equipped to be heroin addicts. Mm, they might as well just leave it alone then. But, so, huh? I, they might as well just leave it alone. But I don't want to get caught up. Yeah, leave it alone. Yeah, yeah, leave but it alone. That's okay. I, just, I mean, I'm just curious. I'm just curious. Yeah, so, well, he, he, you know, I don't think that I think that's common knowledge in the jazz circles that he was a heroin addict. You know, I think that. Yeah. Was, now you wrote this book about Lee Morgan, so you you interviewed all these different cats. Did you get it on tape? I mean, do you think you'll be able to 
write other articles and books based on past interviews? My next book is going to be on the Carolina Jazz Connection, the fascinating Carolina Jazz Connection, and the fact that there are over 75 uh, native North Carolinians, not to mention John Coltrane, Thelonious Monk, Max Roach, and Nina Simone. Percy Heath was born in my hometown of Wilmington. Okay. So um, I have implemented and used some of these interviews uh -huh. that I've written. But I'm not thinking about doing that right now. I'm thinking about coming out. Well, I'm basically thinking about trying to promote the lady who shot Lee Morgan. But well, sure. You got the, next book, the next book is on the North Carolina. Carolina Charlotte. The mm -hmm. fabulous, fantastic blessing. The Carolina Jazz Connection. Duke Ellington's father was born in North Carolina. Wow. How about that? His parents were born in Murfreesboro, North Carolina. It's so fascinating. Mm -hmm. Charlie Ross. This, the saxophone player. His parents were born in North Carolina. It's just fascinating. Billy Taylor, Dr. Billy Taylor. Oh, yeah, Dr. Billy Taylor. Okay. Now, I did you? Talk to him. Yeah. So I, I can imagine all this is already up in your head. But do you have to do more research, or um, or do you, are you just going to wait a while? Um, wait a while. I got a bunch of information. Yeah, right. I know you want to promote first. Yeah. Yeah, I do lectures. I do lectures called the Carolina Jazz Connection, and I have a blog spot called the Carolina Jazz Connection with Larry Thomas. And so one of my things is to show people that North Carolina is not Hicksville. <laughs> North Carolina is just sophisticated as any other spot. I've been, I've been from the East Coast to the West Coast, to the mm -hmm. Caribbean, to Africa. Mm -hmm. you know? okay. Everywhere that I've been, I dig North Carolina best of all because we're just as hip as anybody else. You understand? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, no other state can can brag about the fact that John Coltrane came from here. Or the Mm-hmm. You know, or Max Did Roberts. You know, did you know that Thelonious Monk had his phone number in the New York City phone book, the white pages, just like he was just some average Joe? Did you know that? I didn't know. I read his book, though. It's a fantastic book. Uh, have you read that book? Robert. I actually have not. I have not. American Original by Robert. I was unaware of that. I need to get it and I need to read it. So it's, it's, it's a big, big book. It's actually, it goes all the way back to the beginning of his family. And I think they're from, um, I want to say. Rocky Mount. Well, they're originally from a little, a, a small town outside of Goldsboro. Oh, okay. It's not Wayne County, but Dublin County. He went all the way back to the plantation. It's interesting, oh. Colonius Monk's father died in an insane asylum in Goldsboro. Oh, and, and the East brother's mother passed in an insane asylum in an insane asylum too. It's interesting. I guess yeah. the music drives you crazy. I um, doubt that. I am sure it was just certain. I gotta but, have it. Well that's a lot for you to write about, isn't it? Oh yeah. I've, I've already have an outline and everything, you know. And there's a, there was also a thing that I, I forgot to mention about in Wilmington. I lived in a neighborhood which right around the corner there used to be a, a old dance club. Mm -hmm. My father would talk about, every time somebody like Count Basie or Joe Williams would come on TV, he said, oh, I've seen those guys before. And I knew my father never went to New York much because he hated New York because all of his brothers and sisters went to the city and they basically had bad luck in New York, so he hated New York. And I said, well, you didn't go to New York. Where'd you see these people? He said, right around the corner at the barn. Yeah. Count Bates, uh, Louis Armstrong, um, all these people. Jimmy Lunksford, he loved Jimmy Lunksford. All That's these my people favorite thing. To Wilmington during the late 40s, the 40s and the 50s, yeah. they, would, they would travel what was called a tobacco road circuit. They would go to Rocky Mount, paying tobacco bonds, Come to mm -hmm. Durham. Fats Wall used to come to Durham all the time. Ooh, come okay. to uh, Kinston, Goldsboro, Kinston, and then come to Wilmington and go from there southward. All these big bands came came through during the 40s and the 50s. So I'm I'm going to write a little bit about that place. That place was called the Barn. Mm -hmm. I'm going to write a little bit about that in Wilmington, the dance hall, very historic dance hall. Jimmy Heat played there. The I don't band. think you're ever going to run out of material then. No, I'm full of it. <laughs> <laughs> so give us your, before we go, can you, um, well, let me hold up the book again. Right. Where can people get this book? I know they want to read it. The Lady well, Who Shot Morgan. 
Yeah, they can go to my, my publisher's website. It's uh, www.khabooks.com. That's www.khabooks.com. And it's available locally at these local bookstores over in Durham. The regulator bookstore has it, and there's another bookstore on Main Street called Letters mm -hmm. where they can pick it up and if they're li listening in the area. But for those of you who are listening worldwide, to Pat Murray's very popular program, you probably got people listening from all over the world. Huh? They're probably okay. listening to New Zealand and everywhere, Paris. Well, I, I, I hope that my show is popular. We'll see. Oh, well, I hope this one takes off. But that, that's for the people who are living here in, in the area. Uh, also in Wilmington, it's at the Pomegranate Bookstore down in Wilmington, North Carolina. But what I've tried to do is disseminate it to the independent bookstores. Uh, it was on Amazon for a minute, but I don't think it's on Amazon anymore. You mm -hmm. know, contact my publisher, www.khabooks.com, and uh, buy my book. Buy my book. <laughs> well, hold up. Do, you, do you have your Wilmington 10 books too? Can you hold those up? Or do you uh, have it? Only got rabbit, rabbit, rabbit. Unfortunately, you see it? Yeah, hold it up to the camera. Let's see. There you go. Unfortunately, uh, I've, I've, I've run out of the true story. I don't have any more true story. You ran out. I sold out. It's been out a long time. It's been out since, since Can't 19. Can't you print up some more? You can print up some more, right? Yeah, I can print up some more, but I'm through with the Wilmington 10. Did you hear me? I'm through with the Wilmington 10. <laughs> well, you gave, it's kind huh? of like you, you, you gave a lot of your life to, to yeah, print man. it out. So I understand. Yeah, I'm through with the Wilmington. I'm, I mean, it's a happy ending. I'm also happy for the cats. They got financial compensation. As a matter of mm -hmm. fact, I helped one of the brothers with his autobiography. You know, nice. I helped nice. edit his autobiography, which hasn't come out yet. But mm -hmm. it's been a wonderful experience. I have a wonderful life. Mm -hmm. I'm happy. Uh, and I got a chance to, to come out with this one. And, you know, I just love what I do. And I'm so... Uh, I'm so how can you not? If your life is, is surrounded with jazz, how can you not like it or love it? It's true. You know, and I'm, I'm so happy. I'm so thankful that you allowed me to come on your program, Pat. I really do appreciate it. Sure, I enjoy your work. I enjoy. I've enjoyed all three of the books you gave me. All three copies, and I've enjoyed each and every one of them. Good. So I just want to make sure that other people knew about them as well. Thank you, thank you, Pat. Okay, and with that, um, I will bid you adieu, Mister. Oh, let me ask you, with your your middle name, I, I see it in quotes. I see all the time, Larry Rennie Thomas. The uh, the middle name is that a nickname or a middle name? That's a middle name. It's actually, but, but my mother pronounces it Renee. It's supposed oh. to be. It's well, she want she. I guess she figured I was going to be kind of a different kind of cat. She wanted to call me Andre, and at the last minute, she called me Larry. My old man would, my father would always say, "Well, who's this Larry?" And then she <laughs> decided she wanted to call me Renee, so she called me Larry Renee Thomas. And nobody, if you Google that name, nobody has it. Nobody, there might be some Larry R. Thomases. There might mm -hmm. be a Larry Thomas. There's plenty of them, but there's no Larry Renee Thomas. I'm the only one, Pat. Well, I've met a couple of Patricia Ann Murrays, and that's okay. really freaky. In fact, once I ordered something from, you know, online, mm -hmm. and I had forgotten that I, uh, after my aunt died, I got rid of my P.O. box and, and reverted back to my home address. And what happened was I had ordered something and forgot to update my address. And they didn't bother to call me to ask what my address was. They probably figured, oh, Durham is some small town. We'll just send it to Patricia A. Murray, Durham. Um, <laughs> whatever Patricia A. Murray we find in Durham, no problem. So right. it just happened. They sent it to another Patricia Ann Murray. In Durham? And, yeah. So my phone rang, and I'm checking my caller ID, and it says Patricia Ann Murray. And I was like, mm hmm. I thought I lost my mind or something. I was like, am I calling myself? But it was this other Patricia Ann Murray, and she was a white Patricia Ann Murray. She had received the package, and she was trying to call around to see whose package this was. Right. So, and I, I've heard of at least two or three Patricia Ann Murrays in this area alone, which is really weird. Very well, weird. There's only one of me. 
Huh? There's only one of me, period. Oh, no, yeah, there's only one Larry Renee. And I thought it was Rennie, but Renee, that's interesting. A lot of people do that. A lot of people think it's Rennie. Yeah. Well, you know, R E N I. But I sometimes I see it in quotations, and I think people mistake it for a nickname because it's unfamiliar to them. Because I have seen it with quotations. No, uh, no, it's 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 my name. It's on my birth certificate. Larry Renee Thomas, not Lawrence. Larry, the one and only and the only. Oh, other. your real name is not Lawrence. No. Who's oh, Larry? Okay. <laughs> You are, you are one interesting cat, as they say. I know. I get that all the time. <laughs> and with that, I will be. So thanks a lot, Larry, for being on the show. I appreciate it. Take care. Take care. If, absolutely. So if you'd like to be on the show, if you are a writer, um, if you are a, I'm, I'm waiting for just the most interesting people in the world to write to me. So just write to Durham Skywriter at gmail.com. And with that, I bid you good evening. Hope to hear from you. Be sure to read the Durham Skywriter. That's Durham's online community paper if you're interested in Durham, North Carolina, or if you used, used to go to NCCU or Duke or whatever in your home state. Um, just read the Durham Skywriter online, durhamskywriter.com. All positive, chock full of information. Anyway, good evening. See you soon. Ciao.